We certainly know that ever since nuclear weapons were invented, the world has been under the shadow of a nuclear disaster. And, of course, we've got to remember that they were invented a long time ago. They are based on science and technology from the 1930s and 40s. And I'm concerned that we may confront equally severe threats from technologies developing in the 21st century and whose consequences are not yet fully worked out. Uh, we know that it may take 50 years or more for a scientific discovery to lead to technology. I think the kind of concern I have mainly is that the new technologies will empower individuals to a far greater extent than before. One slightly reassuring feature of nuclear weapons is that they are very complicated. It needs elaborate special purpose facilities to construct them. What concerns me, especially about new technologies, especially bio and cyber technologies, is that they are in almost all cases dual use and also are likely to involve less elaborate equipment and also knowledge that's going to be widely dispersed among the public. And so I'm concerned about the misuse by error or terror, as it were, of 21st century technologies. And I'm concerned particularly because it would take only a small number of people or even a lone individual to cause really severe, even global damage in our ever more vulnerable and interconnected world. As to what we can do about them, then the most obvious and effective remedy is to minimise the sense of grievance which disaffected groups have because the fewer people exist who have manifest grievances and are therefore motivated to cause disruption, the better. It's still hard to identify what the major risks are because uh, one could not have foreseen in advance nuclear weapons. In fact, Ernest Rutherford in the 1930s famously said that the idea of getting energy from nuclei was moonshine. And so in the same spirit, we have no hope of uh, predicting what will be the actual impact of the technologies which are only now in embryo stages. But I think uh, we can foresee generically that there will be greater empowerment of individuals and in our interconnected world, we'd be all more vulnerable. And this leads to problems of governance, the trade-off between security and privacy and freedom. In a book I wrote 10 years ago, I did express the view that there was a 50-50 chance that within 20 years, there would be, through bio-error or bio-terror, a disaster that would kill a million people. Now, we're halfway through that 20 years. It still hasn't happened. And I'm often asked, would I change the odds now? I don't think I would, because it is something we should still worry about. Indeed, such threats are higher on the agenda now than they were 10 years ago, because biological knowledge has advanced faster, and people are more concerned about being able to modify natural viruses, and also about uh, errors due to the escape of natural viruses from laboratories. And another concern that people now have is that the huge investment that the United States made in uh, um, technology to uh, counter bioweapons has led to the production of lots of experts in this technology. And one of those going rogue could indeed be just the kind of person who could create this sort of uh, disaster. And so I think the threat is getting higher, um, and I just hope I lose the bet, but I feel this is something that we do need to worry about. Another issue I addressed was uh, nanotechnology. There's an idea that goes back to Eric Dressler, who was the first person to write a popular book on nanotechnology of so-called grey goo, the idea that you might produce some self-replicating machine that eats up everything biological. Um, that is still science fiction, and I hope it will remain so. But nanotechnology, in some forms, uh, does obviously lead to the same sort of risks that uh, biotechnology does, because uh, uh, indeed um, a virus is the uh, uh, naturally produced equivalent of a nano machine.
and a very sophisticated one. So there is clearly going to be an enhanced risk of, of nanotechnology. But at the moment, I think the upside of nanotechnology is what's very important. There's a group of people mainly based in the United States, led by Ray Kurzweil, who talk about something called the singularity. They claim that maybe by the 2040s or thereabouts, uh, computers will have achieved human intelligence. And of course, if that happens, uh, then uh, the next machines will be made by them and not by us. So indeed, that would be the last uh, intelligent machine we would ever make. I think that is rather uh, crazy on that time scale, but nonetheless, it is clear that computers are going to achieve far greater processing power and simulate more aspects of what humans can do. I know some people who are experts in computer technology uh, worry about uh, a computer network developing a sort of life and will of its own. That's another threat. So these are things we will have to be concerned about. Um, they may seem science fiction now, but not 50 years from now. Bear in mind that uh, um, what you get on a mobile phone today would have seemed magic no more than 20 years ago. Uh, in your mobile phone, there's uh, the power of a supercomputer of the 1980s. And in your washing machine, there's the computer power of the uh, NASA astronaut who landed on the moon. So there's been huge developments in this computer power, and there's no particular reason why they're going to saturate in the next decade. I think one thing we've learned is that uh, there are new risks to which we're vulnerable which are unlikely but whose consequences, if they occurred, are so serious that we need to be worried about them. and We need to pay an insurance policy, as it were, if we can, to reduce their risk. The way I like to put it is that any new technology is risky. When the first steam boilers were made, then many of them exploded and many people died horribly because of an exploding boiler. But there was a risk to just how horrible an exploding boiler could be. Its effects were fairly localised. Whereas the downsides from some new technologies could be global. And therefore, even a small risk, a tiny probability of something going wrong, is something we should be concerned about. Because when you decide how much insurance premium you're prepared to pay, you multiply the probability of the event by its consequences. And in the case of these new events, because they could be global, then even if the problem is small, we need to worry about them more. And I think there are more events of this kind, the so-called black swan events, which could be a breakdown of the global computer system. I mean, I suppose the financial crisis is an example of one of these, uh, but there could, there could be others. Um, and uh, many of them are unforeseen, and therefore we can't expect to predict them. But we need to make all our uh, global systems resilient, if we can, so that there's no risk, or at least less risk, of uh, a breakdown of uh, food supplies or of uh, communications via the internet, etc., uh, due to a single point failure. Because we depend very much on these, and we know very well that uh, uh, lack of fuel, lack of electricity for a few days in a big city could lead to uh, the city becoming uninhabitable and of course there could be much wider spread events. So we need to be mindful that it's worth paying quite a big insurance premium as it were to minimise the chance of these improbable seeming risks because if they do happen they could be so catastrophic. <laughs>